Born in London in 86, a stout show gent named Richard Parliament. He loves to wrestle, but he loves one more thing, and goes round the world. He fights in his comments and he argues with fans. It's a problem no one understands. If there's two things he loves, it's getting an, and helps round the world. Drinking fine wine, fighting fanboys, handhelds round the world. Top Hat Gaming Man. Hello ladies and gentlemen, Top Pack Gaming Man here. I have returned to the island of Crete in Greece to bring to you yet another exciting series of handhelds around the world. Over the years on this channel, we have looked at many different portable gaming devices as I have travelled across the globe. Today, we are going to be looking at one of the more obscure handheld gaming platforms, this time in the form of the Mega Duck. Yeah! You may remember last year on this channel when I looked at a little system known as the Waltara Supervision. The Supervision was a competitor to the original Game Boy, attempting to grab part of a share of its market. The big competitor to the Game Boy, such as the Sega Game Gear, Atari Lynx and PC Engine GT all tried to take a market share by offering much more powerful full colour systems. As we all know, this effort failed somewhat. So the Supervision on the other hand took a different approach by trying to offer a cheap budget alternative to the big Nintendo platform. Like the Supervision, the Mega Duck existed for much of the same reason. In fact, the system features so many similarities that some people even have the misconception that they are both just the same platform, featuring different names and shells for different regions. Obviously this fact isn't true, as the cartridges for each system are different sizes and each platform has a completely different library of games. The Mega Duck is a rare beast, which at times can be difficult to find at a decent price out in the wild. I searched for one for years. That was until indie game developer Quang, creator of Mau Mau Castle of a Sobby Tech, decided to lend me one of his from his outrageously huge system collection. In typical Sod's law though, later that month I procured my own Mega Duck as a buy now on eBay for under £50. It seems that throughout my life two buses always seem to come along at once. Anyway, in regards to the system's history, we need to go back to the Super Rad and Mondo 90s. The Mega Duck was released by a Hong Kong based company called Wellback Holdings for its Timlex International Division and released in 1993. The system was marketed under various different brands worldwide, including Creatronic and Videojet, and the share of the console came in either white or black plastic. On release, pricing-wise, the only information I can find on the system was that it went on sale in the Netherlands for 129 Dutch guilders, and was sold at a similar price in both France and Germany. This would equate to around 58 euros in today's money. In South America, mainly in Brazil, the Chinese-made Creatronic version was distributed by Cougar USA, also known as Cougar Electronic Organization, and sold as the Cougar Boy, as opposed to the Mega Duck. It is often thought that the name Cougar Boy is a hybrid name, taking the boy part directly from the Game Boy, and the Cougar part imitating the Atari Lynx. Also using this same logic, we can surmise that the Wonder Swan was hilariously named in tribute to the Mega Duck, although obviously this is very doubtful. Personally, when I think of the Mega Duck, I think of a duck with a freaking laser beam on its head. And when I think of a cougar boy, I imagine a middle-aged South American lady boy who preys on innocent folk like myself. As mentioned earlier, the cartridges are very similar to those used on the Waltara Supervision, but slightly narrower with fewer contacts. Conceptually, the electronics inside the Supervision and the Mega Duck are also very similar, and the position of the volume controls, contrast controls, buttons and connectors are virtually identical. However, this would all be expected when both systems tried so hard to imitate the Game Boy. Then again, it wouldn't surprise me if it turned out that there was more to all of this than what meets the eye, especially when you consider how lax the copyright laws are in certain parts of the world. For those who are slightly interested, the primary difference between the Mega Duck and the Cougar Boy is that the Cougar Boy came with a 4-in-1 game cartridge and stereo earphones. It was also possible if you knew someone who was just as bonkers as yourself who wanted to play one of these monstrosities with you, it was possible to buy an additional external joystick so you can play against each other simultaneously. Let's be honest though, the people who own Mega Ducks actually have friends? Here's another little factoid for you. If you was a German and lived in Germany of all places and was mad enough to buy a Mega Duck, then you also had the choice to upset your children with their very own Mega Duck Super Junior computer for all their educational needs. Education, education, education. Also available in Brazil as the Super Quiqui. 
Moving onwards to physically looking at the system, the system has an A, B, Start and Select button, much like the original Game Boy. However, instead of featuring a straightforward D-pad, the system features four spearmint flavoured tic tacs to press face in different directions. Innovative, eh? The system features an LCD screen, which is 2.7 inches by 2.7 inches, which uses a dot matrix resolution at 160 by 144 pixels. The shading was four different levels of grayscale on a green background, just like our old friend the Game Boy once again. The system can apparently handle parallax scrolling backgrounds, which makes it look like the picture was drawn on two sheets, with the top being a bit transparent. Wonderful. In terms of specifications, the Mega Duck reportedly has a CPU with a Zlog Z80, and yes, I do actually know what this is, as it's the same CPU used in the famous Sinclair ZX80, released back in 1980. Yeah. The system uses a 16-bit of RAM over two 8K chips, which makes this a 16-bit liar to be fair, much like some of those other consoles we all love and despise simultaneously. Finally, spec-wise, the system's logic comprises of an 80-pin VLSI chip. Obviously, there was also an obligatory on-off switch, which would enable you to turn this off as soon as you turned it on. In terms of mass, the system weighs about 250 grams without batteries, giving it that very nice, nasty cheap piece of plastic rubbish feel. With batteries, it is a lot heavier though, and takes four AA batteries, once again like the Game Boy. Reportedly, the system features a 15 hour battery life, however, I am not brave or patient enough to test this fact out. So, ladies and gentlemen, now that I've given you a brief outline of the Mega Duck's place in history, I guess it's now time to play and talk about some of the games. Cue the montage. If you remember my Watara Supervision video, the system was littered with poor scrolling Japanese style space shooters. The Mega Duck is no different in this regard, and there is little reason to try out Armor Force really. Ant Soldier is a horrible Lemmings clone, with some of the worst sounding music I have ever heard in the game. Once again, not much to say really, which could be a running theme as I briefly touch on this system's games. Arctic Zone is not too bad, it is basically Tetris, just on crack. In this game you play as a dancing bear from Kazakhstan, Wawa Wiwa, as you throw blocks in rows in an attempt to make them dissolve. This one is not as bad as the previous two games. Second Space, surprisingly, is not a Japanese space shooter. The game is this odd Pac-Man snafu sort of mix of a game, where you turn over panels to reveal pictures. This game is annoying me, as I have heard the music in this game used in another, and I cannot for the life of me remember where. Bomb Disposer is a very decent game, but that is no surprise at all, when you quickly notice the game is just Dr. Mario, with a different coat of bloody paint. From my memory, the Supervision has a Dr. Mario clone too. This pesky bloody developer Sachin, they're at it again. I am not really sure how to describe Black Forest Tower. I suppose you could describe the game as some sort of an odd Legend of Zelda Snow Bros hybrid, which is a combination and a half, I suppose. I have to say I am quite impressed with the utter thrashing the character dishes out with his walking stick. Brickwall is like a strange love child of Arkanoid and Tetris. I am sure this is probably a Timlix all-time classic. However, I have really not found much fun with this one. 
In Beast Fighter, you play as Godzilla in a god-awful platformer, which has character sound effects and animations which are only a small, minor step up from those found on Tiger LCD games. But on the bright side, it brings a bit of variety to the system, I suppose. Common 5-in-1 features probably the greatest game on the Mega Duck, which is um, a Tetris clone. Tetris is arguably the greatest game on the Game Boy anyway, so you could argue that with this game's existence and the Mega Duck's cheap price point, that it renders the Game Boy obsolete. Captain Knack is a cute em up with some of the worst scrolling I've ever seen on a system. As we know though, these Hong Kong handholds love their Japanese space shooters. Mega Duck 4-in-1 features a nice little Space Invaders clone with smooth gameplay and decent animation. Well done, Mega Duck. Magical Tower kind of feels like an old platformer you would find on the Commodore 64 or ZX Spectrum. It moves smoothly and isn't too bad really. Nothing to mock with this one. It's a decent hand. Get it? Because uh, you play as a hand. Yep. Pile Wonder is a puzzle game that involves pushing crates around the screen into certain positions. Not too bad at all. I remember playing a game just like this on the Supervision 2, come to think of it. Puppet Knight is a picture perfect clone of Bomberman. Come to think about it, I played a Bomberman clone similar to this on the Supervision as well. So once again, we can see Satchin's handiwork in place with this one. Bootleg or not, who doesn't love Bomberman? Railway involves laying a track to create a path so that a train can pass from point A to point B. Once again, I've experienced a game like this before. It was on the NES, I believe. Maybe someone in the comment section can let me know what the game is I am talking about. In Street Rider, you play as a Formula Un car collecting coins, navigating your way through a maze, avoiding other cars. The game plays a bit like Pac-Man, just zoomed in a lot further. Also, what the bloody hell is wrong with most of the music on this system? Bloody ear grating, to say the least. Trap and Turn is basically solitaire on the game cartridge. I really like it when you put a piece in the wrong place and the game says, can't put, in proper English. Wonderful. Worm Visitor is a delightful little frog clone. The game is not too bad, I suppose, if you could ignore the glitch here and there. Pesky bloody Satchin again. Zip Ball is a game that involves manipulating your balls so that no monsters can touch them. Who hasn't been here before, eh, ladies and gentlemen? This is a basic overhead puzzle game, which can be fun, I suppose, on occasion. Last, but not least on my list, we have Snake Roy. Probably the most famous game on the Mega Duck, due to the game's ridiculous name and uh, crazy box art. It is impossible to make a Mega Duck video without mentioning this infamous game. The game is just basically a half-decent version of Snake, or the Nokia 3210. And who doesn't love Snake, eh? So ladies and gentlemen, that was some of the games for the Mega Duck platform. And when you consider that most of these games came out in 1993, the same year that Wario Land came out on the original Game Boy, then these games are absolutely awful in comparison. Sure there is fun to be had here and there, but all the good games are just decent clones of other games already available on the Game Boy. In fact, you can play a lot of these exact games on the Game Boy anyway, as Satchin released multi-carts for the Game Boy containing many of these games within overall rendering the Mega Duck pretty rubbish and pretty pointless. If I was to say which is better or worse out of the Supervision and the Mega Duck, it is pretty hard to say as both platforms seem to aim fairly and equally low. So is the Mega Duck worth playing today? As expected I am going to have to say a big fat no with this one, not a chance in bloody hell. The Mega Duck serves only one purpose today and that is a somewhat of a rare prey in which wealthy game procurers like myself want to hunt down and add to our collections just to get our hands on such niche obscure hardware. The Mega Duck is literally that, an odd collector's piece to laugh at, a which can be quite difficult to hunt down and source. I have to say there is more fun in trying to find the Mega Duck than it is actually playing it. So unless you like to sample every gaming platform like myself, I would advise against the Mega Duck. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the Mega Duck system. Let me know in the comment section if you have any memories of this bizarre hardware. If you like this video, do not forget to like the video and subscribe for in-depth retro gaming content on this channel every single week. Also, if you want to receive every video I make straight to your phone, then make sure you hit the notification bell to stay notified.
my channel, Top Hat Gaming Man, is partly funded from the fantastic support and donations I receive from my lovely Patreon benefactors. Thank you so much for supporting the Top Hat Trust. Shoutouts to Carl Johnson, Suzuka Kobayashi, Richard Clark, Andy Aldridge, Michael Keneally, Greg Hooper, Harold Webb, Synth Spaces, Kevin Fahili, David Mountford, Andrew Bozanski, Edward O'Reilly, Peter Dawn, Retail Archaeology, Tom Elliott, Mark S. Hines, Gary Pinkett, and all of my other patrons. You people motivate me to no end when it comes to pumping in hundreds of hours of work in every month to bring these videos to life. So as always, from the very bottom of my heart, thank you ever so much. Cheerio!